Thank you for joining us for our first Siteman Learning with National Leaders, presented by Siteman Cancer Center at Barnes Jewish Hospital and Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Good evening to you. I'm Carol Daniel, your host. You need to know this, that Siteman is an international leader in cancer treatment, research, prevention, and education. Ranked among the top 1% of cancer centers nationally by U.S. News and World Report, Siteman also is one of only a few cancer centers to receive the highest rating of exceptional from the National Cancer Institute. Around 70,000 patients are treated each year by our renowned Washington University physicians across our six locations in Missouri and Illinois. So today, we're discussing prostate and colon cancer, including treatments, the importance of screening, and some critical efforts everyone can make when it comes to prevention. And throughout today's discussion, we invite you to submit your questions. We're gonna to try to get those answers during this live event. We start tonight's conversation with colon cancer. Three out of four colon cancer cases can be avoided with regular screening. Colorectal cancer is the number four cancer in the U.S., with nearly 150,000 new cases each year. And remember, screening is always the best solution. So before we introduce our panelists, I want to let our audience know that we are all fully vaccinated and in accordance with CDC guidelines. Get the vaccine, please. Let's welcome three of our guests today all Washington University physicians whose expertise illustrate the breadth and depth of cancer care and prevention at Siteman. They are Dr. Lannis Hall, a radiation oncologist, Dr. Lewis Thomas, a urological oncologist, and Dr. Karen Rigdon, a medical oncologist. Well, thank you all so much. It's great to be with you. Thank you. Great to be here, Carol. Dr. Regan, let's start with you. Let's talk about how common colon cancer is. And I told you that I've lost a friend mm -hmm. to colon cancer. And let's talk about why men and women, what they should know about it. So um, as previously stated, it's fairly common. It's the fourth most common cancer diagnosis in the United States in men and women. And about 150,000 people are diagnosed annually and about 50,000 people pass away from it annually. And pretty much everybody probably knows somebody who's been touched by it at some point in their lives. Um, it's a significant problem and we're always trying uh, to uh, do better with it. So uh, it's just, it's an important problem. True that it's highly preventable? Yes, absolutely. So um, there are screening tests that persons can do um, to try to detect it early. Um, and it's very important to do that. Cringing already when people think about <laughs> testing and colon cancer. There are a, a lot of excuses from people about why they don't get mm -hmm. the screening. We hear it all the time. You know, I don't have a, a family history of it or, you know, nobody in my family has cancer. But the truth is most people who do get colorectal cancer don't have a first degree relative who, who's had it. It's mainly something that just happens, unfortunately. So. Um, through the years, we've determined that by screening or detecting it early, persons can have a better outcome if we find it early. So it's important to do so. And so we have to speak again, really, yeah. to people who say, I don't know anyone in my family, mm -hmm. so why should I worry about getting mm -hmm. the screening? Absolutely. So. Even if you don't have anyone in your family, you absolutely. should be screened. Absolutely. Everyone should. There really isn't a person who shouldn't consider screening for colorectal cancer. The word I heard was everyone. Mm -hmm. That means everyone. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hall, let's move to you. Um, we've talked about why screening is important, why everyone should be screened. Let's talk about who should be screened and when. Right, so Dr. Rigdon laid the foundation. She said everyone should be screened. So that means men and women, whether you have a family history or not. Um, and so, our screening recommendations have changed just recently and it is because there is an, there's a crisis that we have in colorectal cancer. There is an earlier onset of disease. It used to be for years that we would talk about screening for men and women of average risk beginning at the age of 50. But that has changed. I will say that again, that has changed. 
Now, men and women of average risk beginning should begin screening at the age of 45. And that's average risk. Now, that is to distinguish um, average risk people from high risk. And okay. high risk are people who do have multiple family um, first degree and second degree relatives. And what is that? A first degree relative is uh, someone who is your sister or your daughter or son or your parent, so one degree away from you. The, those people who have uh, a history of colon cancer do increase your risk of developing colon cancer. And the more first degree relatives that you have, the more likely that you should begin screening earlier. So what am I getting at? If you have multiple family uh, members who have colon and rectal cancer, or if you have a history of inflammatory bowel disease like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, um, you are considered at higher risk and should be screening earlier than the age of 45. So to understand that better, you should be engaging with your health care provider about when to begin screening. And many people don't have that discussion with their health care provider. They don't have it for breast, and we know it's important. And that is when we do um, what we call a customized or individual risk assessment. And that is where we're going now, to individual risk uh, assessment for breast, uh, for prostate, know your risk, uh, and for colon and rectal cancer so that people can understand when they're high risk, because maybe they need to be screening even 10 years or more uh, earlier. There's one other thing I'd like to say. If you have a family history that is known, uh, if you have a family member that is known to have a mutation, a mutation in a gene um, that is called, uh, that causes a, the disease FAP, familial adenomatous polyposis. That's a long FAP. That's a long name. <laughs> FAP or something called HMPCC, uh, also called Lynch syndrome. If you have anyone in your family, even a even someone that's a cousin that has that, that is information your healthcare provider should know about because maybe you should begin screening much earlier. So having a mutation in a gene that puts you at higher risk for cancers. Anyone in your family who has that or you know about it, you should be telling your health care provider to know what does that mean for me. And besides those guidelines, let's talk about men for a minute because the friend I mentioned who lost his battle with colon cancer um, the, was a man. Yes. And so talk about what men should know in terms of some common symptoms. What are they? So first, can I say that men and women should know the same okay. information? Okay, men and women. Yeah, because colon cancer affects, as we said, all people, men and women. And so the, the, so the symptoms are really about five, right? Okay. Um, the first one, I would say, is a change in bowel habits. So, you know, most of us kind of know our routine right. of... But let's say your routine changes, and it is not just a day thing because of something you might have eaten, but it has been persistently different than what it used to be. A change in bowel habits, more diarrhea, or you're having constipation, or you're having a mixture of the two, or a change in the caliber of your stool. So your stool, you know, used to be a certain size, and you look and you're like, it's the size different. of a cigarette. Mm -hmm. it's, it's much smaller, it's narrow. That is a change in your bowel habits. What if you now see blood in your stool? And, you know, don't think it's hemorrhoids or that, because that's what I hear all the time. I just thought it was hemorrhoids. My doctor actually thought it was hemorrhoids. So maybe it's not hemorrhoids. In fact, rule out cancer first and then agree it may be hemorrhoids. That is what my philosophy would be with that. So blood in the stool is not normal. Frequent and routine blood in the stool is not normal. So then abdominal cramping. You now st are starting to have a lot of cramping and pain, um, and you're not feeling like when you pass your stool that you're actually com um, emptying adequately. You, you feel like, yeah, I went to the, have a 
bowel movement, but I still don't really feel like I evacuated. Yeah, in my house. <laughs> it, did, it didn't, <laughs> didn't really work. Yes. So those are some major symptoms. But then we have what I would call more constitutional symptoms. Like if you have lots of blood loss, but you can't really see it in your stool because maybe that it's a slow leak and it's mixing in, you can start to just feel fatigue. And so you can have weakness or even get to weight loss. So those are symptoms that uh, we really get concerned about because it usually means this is kind of an ongoing process. So just to recap, fatigue or, or weakness, uh, weight loss, a change in bowel habits, blood in the stool, abdominal cramping, change in the caliber of stool. And I do want to be clear, you mentioned higher risk and 45. Are, so are there those who should have that screening even before the age of 45? That's exactly right. So what I was trying to distinguish is all of us that consider ourselves average risk that may have no family history and um, have not had any issues and don't have inflammatory bile disease like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, nothing that would put us at increased risk. We should begin screening at the age of 45. But then there are people who are high risk that we talked about. Okay. Everybody, high risk even sooner than the age of 45. Now, one of the things that can make a meaningful difference is pre in preventing cancer is your diet. Stacy Brock, a BJC healthcare dietitian, was here earlier at the studio and has some great alternatives for fighting cancer in the kitchen. Hi there, I'm Stacy, a registered dietitian with Siteman Cancer Center, and I want to talk to you today about a diet with cancer preventive qualities. So let's start out by looking at the big picture. I always like to mention that diet is just one piece of the cancer puzzle. Changing your diet is never a 100% guarantee that you won't receive a cancer diagnosis someday, but it is a controllable piece of the cancer puzzle because you get to decide what you eat and have the power to change and reduce your risk. Plus, changing your diet to be more cancer protective can often help you in other ways, possibly improving cholesterol levels, blood sugar, your digestion, mental health, and just how you feel overall. Now let's dig into what a cancer protective diet looks like. The American Institute for Cancer Research encourages people to follow a plant-based diet with minimal processed foods, limited added sugars, and limited alcohol. The term plant-based has no official legal definition, so you'll see people using it to describe a vegan diet, while others use it to indicate they're just consuming mostly plant foods. The definition being followed here is that you want to make at least two-thirds of your plate full of plant foods such as fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, and that leaves you with one-third or less of your plate for your animal-based foods. It's really about shifting the balance of that plate. Now let's talk a bit more specifically about preventing colon and prostate cancer. Several studies have found higher risk of colorectal cancer with increased alcohol intake. So it's generally best not to drink alcohol. For those who do drink it, they should have no more than one drink per day for women or two drinks per day for men. Not drinking alcohol may help reduce your risk. Here's an idea. Instead of drinking alcoholic beverages, pour some of your favorite flavored seltzer water in a fancy wine glass. No alcohol and no unnecessary extra calories, but you still get to use a fun glass. Many studies have found a link between red and processed meats and increased colorectal cancer risk. It's generally recommended to consume as little of these foods as possible, with no more than 12 to 18 ounces per week. Many of us choose red and processed meats for protein, but did you know that you can get all the protein you need from plant foods? Try beans, lentils, seeds, soy, nuts, and nut butters. You also get smaller amounts from whole grains and certain veggies. Now let's turn to prostate cancer. If you want to reduce your risk for prostate cancer, get to and stay at a healthy weight, be physically active, and follow that plant-based diet. Also, you want to try to get a variety of colors of fruits and vegetables, ideally aiming for at least one serving of fruit and or vegetable from each color each day. Here's an example of a plant-based recipe full of color called Fiesta Slaw. This citrus-based version combines the natural sweetness of orange juice, mango, and apple with the heat of jalapeno pepper to help bring out the natural flavors of the veggies. We'll have the recipe and cooking instructions for you on the website. One of the things I want to highlight in this recipe is the apples. With apple picking season right around the corner, not only do apples taste delicious on their own, 
but when added to dishes, they come loaded with health benefits. Apples have been linked to numerous health benefits, including improved gut health and reduced risk of stroke, high blood pressure, and diabetes. Consider adding almond or peanut butter to your next apple to add a dose of protein in your snack and help keep you full. This next recipe is also great for fall and full of colorful ingredients. Check out this delicious twist on chili. You have white from the onion and garlic, orange from the carrots and sweet potatoes, green from green pepper, and red from red bell pepper, crushed tomatoes, and tomato paste. I want to make sure we talk about the difference between sweet potatoes and white potatoes. Both types of potatoes are rich in fiber, carbs, and vitamins B6 and C. Sweet potatoes, however, especially the orange and purple varieties, are rich in antioxidants that protect your body from free radicals which have been linked to chronic illnesses like cancer, heart disease, and aging. Consider a sweet potato for an antioxidant boost great for overall health. Try to eat the skin too, it's good for you. I want to show this last recipe, which is banana oatmeal muffins, because people often hear plant-based diet and avoiding processed foods to mean they will never see another baked good again. This does not have to be the case. There are many things you can do with recipe substitutions to make your usual baked goods a healthier version. This recipe contains whole grains in the form of whole wheat flour and oats. That gives us more fiber. Plus, did you know that eating at least three ounces or servings of whole grains per day lowers risk of colorectal cancer? And let's talk quickly about the walnuts in this recipe. This food is rich in antioxidants. In fact, walnuts have higher antioxidant activity than any other common nut. They also provide healthy fats, fiber, vitamins, and minerals. I want to mention one last thing, super seeds, because they're great for your diet. Both chia and flax seeds are full of nutrients and are exceptionally high in fiber, omega-3s, proteins, and fat. They're both great for providing better digestion, blood sugar levels, and protecting against certain types of cancer. Consider adding them to smoothies, yogurts, salads, and rice dishes. These three recipes are available on this site, but if you would like more information regarding a cancer preventative diet, you can go to www.siteman.wustl.edu. Okay, so what have we learned? Go out and try a new fruit or vegetable. Try a new whole grain. Try one of these new recipes. You may not like everything, and that's okay, but you may stumble upon some new creations that you'll love that also provide your body with a lot of really great nutrition. Great job, Stacy. Thank you so much. I, for one, am going to try the sweet potato chili because I love chili and I love sweet potatoes and I'm trying to be healthier. That was some great advice. Small changes that you can make that will make a big difference in your life. So let's see if we have any questions so far about colon cancer for our panel. So here's one. My twin brother has been told he has prostate cancer. We are 65. He is still working. What should he plan to do for treatment? Doctors? Well, can we hold that one? Mm -hmm. Because it's about prostate cancer to um, have our, have Dr. Thomas. We sure can. Yeah, and mm -hmm. then, but we do have one. If I, my eyes, Carol, my eyes are Yeah, bad. the words are little, <laughs> um, the words are little. How much does diet play into colon cancer? And we, and we, Stacy gave us some recipes and things yeah. to do. I thought she was great. Yes. And, and this, this um, question was answered by Stacy, I think, in a great way. And we can recap, right? Because we know that there are some modifiable risk factors. And let's just recap those, right? It's diet, so having a low fat, high fiber diet, that's what Stacy said. Right. With lots of fruits and vegetables and with multiple colors and being physically active. Um, we know that obesity, and that means carrying, you know, too much fat on our frame uh, for our height, increases our risk of colon cancer later in life. So being physically active and choosing some better foods, mm -hmm. that will help to reduce that whole obesity risk. So I think, I think Stacy answered the question. She really did well. Yeah. And, she, and she gave you, because 
I think so many people are, I want to eat right, but I don't know what to do. Right, and, and she told us. And recipes seem hard, but they're really not. They're really not. Right. Um, why don't we turn our attention, as you mentioned, to um, prostate cancer? Uh, but we want to thank you again, Stacy, for all of that information. And we do encourage you to ask questions about prostate or colon cancer prevention. All you have to do is submit them right here on the site. We have a team in the background working on that, and we will get those questions answered for you. So switching gears now to prostate cancer, the number one cancer in the U.S. for men except skin cancer. We're talking nearly 250,000 cases being diagnosed each and every year. So you saw him on screen already. Let's welcome in Dr. Lewis Thomas uh, to our panel. Um, explain first what the prostate is, where it's located, and what does it do? Sure. So, uh, and, and that's a great question. I think there's kind of a lot of, uh, it's not one of the organs that comes up on operation commonly for people. Um, so uh, the prostate is, a, uh, is part of the male uh, reproductive uh, uh, system essentially. And it's a, a ping pong ball sized organ that is kind of at the uh, base of the bladder. Um, and the best way I can kind of describe is a little graphic, but um, for men, it's, it's kind of right above the perineum, which is the area between the scrotum and the anus, essentially. And it's a donut-shaped organ that goes around the urethra, which is the tube that uh, people urinate out of or men urinate out of. Um, and it, it has a number of functions. Um, one of the main things that it does is it essentially kind of brings together all the elements of uh, male ejaculate for, for uh, reproductive health. Um, and so the testicles produce sperm and those sperm then go up a tube to the prostate and then in the prostate they're deposited into the urethra. Um, and so the prostate has a lot of important functions releasing various kind of chemicals to uh, uh, kind of make the environment right uh, for the sperm to survive. Um, and then it also has important functions and essentially uh, making sure that the urinary and the uh, reproductive systems kind of stay, stay separated. Um, and so um, it kind of sits at that interface between the, uh, the urinary and the sexual systems for men. So being one of the most common cancers seen at Siteman, and we're talking an average of 700 cases a year, yeah. that's pretty common to me. Is that true? It's very common. Oh, yeah. No, no. It's, it is... Uh, uh, yeah, one of the most common diagnoses that we see in our clinics. Um, you know, it's about one in eight men over the course of their life will be diagnosed with prostate cancer. Um, and about one in 40 men will actually die of prostate cancer. So um, this is a very common, uh, very common illness that, that, yeah, we see every single day. Because I am a wife, and that means I'm also a doctor in my home. <laughs> I make all the appointments. I'm just kidding, I don't make all of them, but I make a lot of them. Um, I have read everything I could so that I could make sure my husband was getting the tests that he needed when he needed to get them. Are there groups that are at greater risk? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, there's a couple that I, you know, tend to focus on predominantly. So, so one is anyone with a family history of prostate mm -hmm. cancer. And, you know, we're now into about year 30 of PSA screening. And so we're now kind of seeing a second generation of men who do know that they have a family history because their dad was screened or their dad was diagnosed with cancer. Um, in particular, I like to focus on men who have a uh, kind of a earlier onset of cancer. So the average age for diagnosis of prostate cancer is 66 years old. Okay. okay? And the age increases as men get older. Okay. So uh, the man who has, whose father was diagnosed when he was 80, I'm not as concerned about necessarily. It's the guy whose dad was diagnosed when he was in his early 60s or his late 50s um, that's really setting off alarm bells that says we need to be screening this man. Um, the other cohort that comes up is, is black men. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we don't know exactly what the biological factors are that contribute to this, but. Um, black men seem to basically have a increased or an increased risk at an earlier age of being diagnosed with prostate cancer. And kind of the rule of thumb that I've adopted is I generally will kind of recommend screening uh, about 10 years earlier for, for black men overall, okay? Um, the last one that comes up is, is kind of 
odd because we don't usually think of them as connected, but men with a family history of early onset breast cancer in some of the female relatives or ovarian cancer. And there's common uh, genetic uh, mutations that lead to uh, breast cancer in women or, or ovarian cancer in women that can also lead to high risk prostate cancer in men. So those are kind of the three, uh, the three groups that, you know, in my, in my history taking and in my counseling, I'd say, you know, you are definitely someone that needs to be screened and consider screening at an early age. And so we have the numbers. What's the age for black men? I usually recommend age 45 for, 45. for black men and, okay. a, and age 55 for, uh, for basically uh, white or Hispanic men. So that means wives, we have to start talking to them when they're about 40, because it <laughs> might take a couple of years to get them ready yeah. for that screening. Uh, I'm joking, but that's the way that we can, can get this information out there. You'll remember the humor. Um, Dr. Rigdon, talk about screening options. Uh, for prostate cancer? So uh, we've kind of already touched on that. It's the PSA, which is a blood test, basically. Mm -hmm. So it's not invasive. Um, it's a blood test that can be performed. And usually these conversations start um, with a patient with their primary care physician. Um, and it's generally recommended starting on average age around 55 for most average risk people, not the people that Dr. Lewis was talking about. Yeah, the higher risk people for the average risk people. And it's basically recommended to consider a conversation with your healthcare provider of the pros and cons of getting this blood test and screening, so. And, and doc, does, a, does an enlarged prostate, men get nervous when they hear that? That's not a predestined, that's not, that doesn't mean you have no. cancer, no. right? No. I don't know. No. No. Yeah, I would say so. Um, the two are actually very separate uh, uh, diseases. And, and I guess there's kind of, if there's one thing that I, I would also emphasize uh, for men, you know, considering prostate cancer, it's that very rarely does prostate cancer pre prevent, or present with symptoms, okay? So I, I see people who come in every day with, you know, a slowing down urinary stream, erectile dysfunction, things like that those are not necessarily common symptoms of prostate cancer. And I certainly would not tell a man that he is uh, at low risk of prostate cancer because he doesn't have any sort of symptoms. Um, like Dr. Rigdon uh, uh, mentioned, you know, the screening test is a PSA test and probably 95% of the patients I see with prostate cancer are asymptomatic when they, when they have that mm -hmm. test done. Um, uh, BPH, which is a, a benign prostatic hyperplasia, uh, an enlarged prostate is another condition of the prostate that comes up for men as they get older and can cause urinary symptoms for them, uh, but is a benign condition. It's not a cancerous condition. All right. Want to put your minds at ease a little bit there, but we still want to get the screening done. Um, Dr. Hall, I, I know personally, because you and I have been in many um, rooms together, many events together, that you do a lot of outreach work with community groups, um, working with them, of course, to get the word out about the importance of cancer screenings. What do you think is the most important thing for people to know about preventing cancer? We've talked about a lot tonight. I think a lot of people think that cancer is something that happens to them and they have no control over it. Hmm. And that's absolutely not the case. So we know that many cancers that develop, develop over time and they're related to um, our lifestyle choices. So we have 13 cancers now that uh, are increased in people who are overweight or obese or not physically active. So we know that the role of exercising, and it seems to be consistent across all cancers, five days a week, 30 to 45 minutes a day, um, is significant in reducing your risk. And we're talking about breast cancer, colorectal carcinoma, where uh, these are excellent and more, con these are the, our most common cancers, right? And so this is not um, uh, cancers that are rare. Lung cancer, 90% of our lung cancers are caused by tobacco exposure. So if you don't take up a bad habit like tobacco use, the likelihood of developing a lung cancer is low. Then we get the prostate cancer, and prostate cancer doesn't have a whole lot of modifiable risk factors, meaning things that you can change in your life and say, I have now reduced my risk. But that does not mean that we shouldn't adopt a healthy diet um, and exercise and also 
perform our screenings. And why do we want to perform our screenings? Because this has come up a couple times. There's no signs or symptoms uh, to alert you to a change that you might be having in the colon, in the rectum, or in the prostate. Um, for colon and rectal cancer, you can develop an abnormal growth. There's no early signs or symptoms of that. But we have one of our, st our tools to screen for it is outstanding. The best one that we have, and it's called a colonoscopy. And the reason it's so outstanding is because it detects an abnormal growth, but can also remove it right. at the same time. So it is a therapeutic modality in addition to a diagnostic modality. And so if you don't have any polyps, because it takes so long for these abnormal growths to turn into cancers, you have a colonoscopy, no polyp, you go 10 years before they tell you to return. Mm -hmm. If you have polyps, then you might have to go at three or five years, depending on maybe even sooner, depending on what's found, but it's a diagnostic and therapeutic mod modality. The PSA, a simple blood test. Now we do also want to do a digital rectal exam, but for those men who are not yet there, you can start with a simple blood test. It gives you a snapshot of the health of your prostate way before you would have any symptoms. Because if you have blood in your urine or if you have back pain, it's too late in the mm. sense of us catching it early and giving you some of the easiest treatments or not treating at all, but monitoring it closely, called active surveillance. We don't want to miss our window to be in control of our, what I would say, our destiny. We don't want to have to be told you're going to be under treatment for the rest of your life. You're going to have to have something to control this and you'll never get a break. So. Screenings allow us to catch something and have treatment that's effective and causes less side effects. And that's so much better than being told a very different story. Right. right. Give yourself a chance. We're going to take some questions, and we have um, several in just a second. But I wanted to get one last um, question to you, Dr. Hall. And, and my 21-year-old, I have two sons, He's the youngest. He's trying to get me to drink more water. I used to be very active, like a lot of you, and, and things happen. Life gets in the way. So he's encouraging me, which I think is wonderful. How do we, for, for the people out there who are, they have the great diet. They're already doing it. They're working out all the time. They're eating every sweet potato chili recipe that comes past their plate. How do, we how do they encourage others like my son is encouraging me? what your son is doing is probably showing you an example of change. And I, I think it, the first thing that should happen is be an example. You know, it's, it's hard to tell someone to go get screened and you haven't been screened. Right. Or to start eating five to seven fruits and vegetables and you're not eating one or two. So be the example for your friends and loved ones because, you know, peer pressure can be good. You know, so having pressure in the right direction, but then also education. The truth is, a lot of people don't know what they should be doing and when they should be doing it mm -hmm. and where to go. So that's the next thing. Um, know that we offer free PSA screenings if you're uninsured. Um, to reach out to our to Siteman Cancer Center at our PCAD website. So just go Siteman Cancer Center free screenings so you can get a PSA free. We have a statewide program called Show Me Healthy Women for breast and cervical cancer screening and we're starting to do free colon cancer screenings with our stool based tests. Mm. And you know that's a new that's a new push for us. So we recognize the importance of screening and that some people don't have the means to get screened. So we can't tell people to go out and get screened and then they have no way to do it. So we offer these free screenings. They're out there. Um, but I, I would say first be the example um, and then talk about it. Because, you know, unfortunately, as we've talked about, a lot of these cancers are starting at an earlier age. And that means that there are a lot of life years lost if we right. don't have, if we're not in control of our health. Right. Okay. And that's why we're doing this, the series, so that you can be in control. And 
get the information you need so that you can pass it on to the people that you love and respect. So let's go to our audience for some more questions here. Um, one wants you to outline and discuss uh, the monitoring and treatment options following radical, open, and what is that word, doctors? Prostatectomy. What's a good source for further learning on that particular topic? Anyone? Sure, yeah. Uh, so, so radical prostatectomy is a, is a surgical procedure that we use to treat prostate cancer um, in which the prostate is, is surgically removed. And the monitoring after prostatectomy is essentially all PSA based. So PSA is a unique uh, chemical, actually it's an enzyme, it's a unique enzyme that's released by the prostate and, and uh, it can be picked up in the bloodstream. And so after the prostate is removed, uh, the PSA should essentially be zero. Um, and so uh, it, there's not really necessarily imaging that's done um, or anything like that. It's just uh, routine PSA testing. And I usually recommend, um, it's a rather intensive regimen, usually for the first two years and then getting less intensive after that. But I recommend men get screened, or not get screened, get a PSA test um, basically once a year uh, um, if they've had a prostatectomy for the rest of their life. So. And let's go to the earlier question that we had, yeah. um, and that was about the twin brother. Um, they're both 65. He's still working. What should the plan be for treatment? That's that not your patient necessarily, but what can yeah. you say? Yeah, um, you know, prostate cancer kind of comes in all shapes and sizes, and it really runs the gamut from very indolent forms of prostate cancer that we basically just monitor for people. And... Um, then there are other uh, what we call intermediate risk types um, for which there's a number of treatment options available, either radiation therapy like Dr. Hall provides, surgery, um, and even monitoring for some people with intermediate risk cancer as well. Um, and then, you know, generally for higher risk cancers, we're talking about a combination of therapies, um, usually uh, uh, a mix of surgery, radiation, and hormonal treatments overall. So, uh, you know, without knowing a lot of the details, right. um, it's hard to make uh, firm recommendations, but there's almost always a variety of options in each disease state, and that can be tailored to kind of a patient's, um, you know, a patient's kind of uh, tolerance of risk, tolerance of side effects, things like that. Um, and these are, I mean, Dr. Hall and I can attest, these are long conversations sure. about what to do, um, but, but there's the, a lot of good stuff. <laughs> yeah, and the key is it should be multidisciplinary, yeah. meaning, y you know, we do our best work when we do it together. Mm -hmm. So it is um, ideal and it is important for you to have a discussion about all your treatment options so that you know that you've been fully informed to make an educated decision about what's best for you. And, and I think that's what we want to drive home is that prostate cancer requires a multidisciplinary approach. That's why the three of us are sitting here. There are various options for low, intermediate, and high risk disease. And um, the combination of us together usually gets us to the best treatment program. And I do gather the fact that his sister has mentioned he is still working, that that's some level of concern. Maybe they want treatment that doesn't interfere too much and too long with his, because people want to continue to work, clearly. You know, I will say this. We have made some incredible advances in surgical options for prostate cancer with laparoscopic or robotic that Dr. Thomas can go into and giving treatment with radiation in a week's time when it used to be eight weeks of radiation. Oh, wow. And so um, it's important to sit down and have a conversation with people who specialize because you might find wow, this was a lot different than I expected in terms of my options and the potential side effects and my downtime from work right. or not. Uh, so I think it's important to have that multidisciplinary you know, discussion with your doctors. Yeah, and people's lifestyles always come into play with conversations, right. and we try to tailor things to fit what their needs are That's too. That's exactly right. right. So, yeah. And let's just say, way to go, sis. <laughs> looking out for your twin brother. We, yeah. we appreciate that. Um, one more about prostate cancer. If it is in the bone, can it be treated? 
-hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, and I guess I would say, uh, well, yes, yes, it can. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> you know, oftentimes when we're seeing patients with uh, advanced prostate cancer, we're talking about treatments to suppress the disease rather than to cure it, unfortunately. Um, we are, though, getting to an era where particularly uh, patients with uh, cancer that has spread to just kind of one spot in the bone um, can be treated effectively with radiation therapy and actually cured in, in some situations. Um, and so it, it's definitely an exciting new era in prostate cancer. Um, in particular, we have kind of newer imaging to detect some of these um, bony, what we call metastases or sites of spread and uh, newer ways to administer uh, treatment to those sites. So yes, unequivocally it can be treated mm -hmm. um, okay. and now even sometimes cured for mm -hmm. select patients. I have been so excited by the results that we have seen in patients that at one point had incurable disease mm -hmm. um, and now we have better medications that Dr. Rigdon um, <laughs> delivers. <laughs> And then we have better ways of delivering high doses of radiation to small areas. Right. So then where you have one or two areas of the bone that are involved and we can give what we call ablative, meaning mm -hmm. just destroy the cancer cells in that area but keep the bone intact. And then Dr. Rigdon comes in with these wonderful drugs mm -hmm. that, uh, <laughs> that takes away what we call the microscopic risk, mm -hmm. meaning the disease, these cancer cells can go somewhere else mm -hmm. right. and set up shop in other bones, in other organs, and we need to sterilize the bloodstream. So the bloodstream is sterilized and then we're getting rid of the areas of involvement that we can mm -hmm. see radiographically. Mm -hmm. That is a concept that is new. We used to say metastatic and there was just no way right. that we could control it, mm -hmm. um, maybe for a little while, but ultimately we would not uh, have successful treatment for what we call stage four prostate cancer, but that is just not what we're seeing these days. So we don't want someone to present with stage four, and we've got a great screening test that catches prostate cancer very early, and we have excellent treatments for all stages of disease, but we are excited about the possibilities that we have for even advanced prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Rigdon, it's fascinating. I mean, this has happened. I've been covering cancer medical treatment of all kinds for over 30 years. It's almost, it seems overnight. It's not, but it's no, such a difference in what you can do yes. now. Yes, I was just, I saw a gentleman today that Dr. Hall and I have been treating for 15 years with disease um, that started in his bones and um, with various lines of treatment, we're, we're doing things much better than we used to. We're not perfect, no, but we're doing right. We're doing much better than what we used to do, so. Let's get another question in, um, and one of our viewers wants you to touch on more sophisticated blood and urine tests, which are helpful if PSA rises, possibly indicating prostate cancer. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, you know, so PSA is kind of the, the test that gets that people baseline. in the door, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, but um, kind of uh, uh, circling back to that enlarged prostate discussion, um, an enlarged prostate can also lead to an elevated PSA. And so there's a lot of men out there walking around with elevated PSA levels who do not have prostate cancer. Um, the PSA helps us identify the men who are at higher risk. And now we have a number of new blood and urine tests that can further risk stratify men and, and help us decide on if they need a biopsy or not. Um, some of the common ones that we use, um, there are uh, at least a, a handful of additional blood tests um, that kind of give us a better risk stratification for the man with an elevated PSA. I use those commonly in my practice, and I would say probably about a third of men who come through the door with an elevated PSA, I can tell them they're actually at very low risk of prostate cancer just doing another blood test, okay? okay. Um, the other one that's come along kind of in the last 10 to 15 years has been using MRI uh, as both a risk assessment tool and a tool to help us improve the diagnostic yield when we do a biopsy. Um, so MRI can look for areas of concern in the prostate 
And if there aren't areas of concern, well, maybe that individual might not need a biopsy. That's a little controversial, but, but they may be at lower risk. If there are areas of concern, then we know where those areas are and we can target them precisely and make sure that we uh, get a, 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 you know, a firm diagnosis on what they have. So um, I think we've gotten a lot smarter over the last 20 years about how we use these screening tests. Mm -hmm. We've used them to you know, hopefully identify a higher risk uh, cohort of men um, who we can then do better uh, and more um, targeted biopsies on. So there's a, a ton of these tools. Uh, I won't get into all of them, but, but most of them are minimally invasive, either blood, urine, or imaging tests that we can do. Mm -hmm. right. What I heard was ton of tools. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I heard, yes, and that's impressive. Um, let's try to get in one last question, I believe, unless the people in my ear and my head tell me differently. Okay. <laughs> what are some of the um, screening options for, I believe that's CRC, is that CPC? Yeah. Mm -hmm. CRC, colorectal. CRC that uh, you recommend, and we're talking average risk. Right, so, do you, so average risk, we have kind of two tiers or two types of tests. One are called stool-based tests. Mm -hmm. So those are tests that you can do at home and you get a little bit of stool and it's either looking for DNA, so that is a particular type of test you can do and that is changes in the DNA that you should not see in normal stool or you're looking for blood mm -hmm. um, and there's also one called an immunohistochemical test. So we've got these three stool-based tests that you can do at home and they're done either annually or every three years, depending on which one. And, you know, I'll just say it, a lot of people like Cologuard, you know, because it is, uh, if it's negative, you can go more than a year before you need another one. But then we have the tests that I think are more the gold standard, and those are our visual tests. And so the CT colonography, using a CAT scan, um, or sigmoidoscopy. But the gold standard is a colonoscopy because you have visualization of the entire colon. So the right side of the colon, the transverse and the left side, and you're removing any abnormal growth from the entire colon. And again, if you don't see any abnormal growth, you get to go 10 years <laughs> <laughs> before you get screened again if you're average risk. So um, we have these visual tools we just talked about and then the stool-based tools. Mm -hmm. Gold standard. I, thought, I bet you thought you'd never hear <laughs> colonoscopy and gold standard in the same sentence, but our panelists say it is true. <laughs> yes. Thank you mm -hmm. so much. I want to ask you one last question before we go. We've got a little bit of time. Uh, just one from me. I've heard from a lot of people over the years who felt that their doctor didn't have a sense of urgency. They were worried about something. They had, you know, an enlarged prostate. They had a change in the bowel movements and they didn't feel their doctor had a sense of urgency. What do you advise them to do? Get another opinion. I mean, I, if you feel like you're not being heard, find someone who will listen to you because at the you end of the day, you know your body the best. And right. if you feel like something's wrong, continue to seek answers until you're satisfied that you're okay. Um, do you agree? Yeah. I, just a thousand percent. Yeah. We are our own best advocate. Mm -hmm. And what we know now is, for example, for colon cancer, which we've been talking about all night, we have more younger people mm -hmm. getting diagnosed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And even before many of our healthcare providers were trained to think about that as what might be going on. So if you have a change in bowel habits, if you have any of those symptoms, or you just don't feel right, find a healthcare provider who's gonna ferret this out with you because you know, you know yourself better than anyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I would agree. And I mean, PSA screening um, has been kind of controversial over the years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and one of, the, one of the odd things has been balancing kind of the anxiety that testing can provoke right. with um, uh, the risks of missing a possibly treatable cancer for people. Um, but I guess kind of if, if a patient is anxious about a risk of prostate cancer because they're not getting tested, mm -hmm. 
then um, you, you know you're not saving them any worry or anything mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that uh, certainly, um, you know, talking you know very deliberately with your primary care doctor about it, mm -hmm. um, or even seeking out uh, you know someone like a gastroenterologist mm -hmm. or a urologist um, with your concerns uh, can often be valuable. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you all so much, Dr. Thomas, Dr. Rignan, Dr. Hall. Thank you for your expertise. Thank you for caring. And I, I can, it's clear that they play and work as a team. Yeah. Thank you very much for your information tonight. I, I hope that you've come away with something this evening um, that is going to open your eyes and enlighten your understanding of how you can be in control of your own health. And thank you again for joining us, for taking this important step. And it is indeed important, an important step towards a healthier healthier tomorrow and a healthier life. So if you'd like to learn more, we invite you to visit yourdiseaserisk.com. It's a free service of Siteman Cancer Center. It offers even more tips for reducing your risk of disease. Now we hope you'll register for our next event. It is Wednesday, October 20th. We'll talk about breast and gynecological cancer. Please join us then. We'll be ready for those registrations tomorrow. So just come right back here to learn how you can get registered and to learn more about the nationalleaders.com. That's where you go to get signed up, nationalleaders.com. Thanks again for being part of tonight's discussion. Have a great evening.